anybody had a chance to look at any of the pre-recorded ones that are now on YouTube? So you could type me, I can turn, look at the chat and you could type just a yes or a no. So there's only a handful of you. There's, oh, there's eight of you now. So if everybody just typed yes or no that you've actually watched any of the pre-recorded ones, I'm just curious. Um, uh, so they're all up and I'm just wondering how easy they are to navigate from people and you can let your friends know we have not made an official announcement. So I'm getting mostly, yeah, Kathy, I think search for me. Um, my um, uh, um, tech guy, <laughs> I got tech guys and girls. Um, I, we haven't done anything special, so I'm just asking people do a search and if there's any difficulties, let me know. Um, but it's a YouTube channel and it's Sandy Rogers, not Ace Dog Sports. Um, and I think we're up to 19. Next week we'll make an even 20. And um, I'm hoping that we get um, even more traction because of the magazine going. So type me yes or no. Did you know that Clean Run is putting out their last issue online? They went, they discontinued the, the paper version. Um, yes, yeah, sad from Kathy. Yes, from Karen. Um, Christine knows. And um, so, yeah, um, these are going to end up being flashbacks. And um, learned of it recently from Tanya. Yeah, so... Clean Run is going to keep on educating, though, and I am going to keep on being one of their educators. So um, I, uh, that pre-agility, my pre-agility program that I keep saying, I'm starting to count how many times I say it's almost done, and then I pay myself a dollar. <laughs> so I'm getting rich by being almost done. But what happened with pre-agility is... Um, you know, I started the project sort of like the two on two off and just got so inspired by the potential. And uh, Peggy is here with us today and she, her and her little Sheltie Hazel are kind of the stars of the program. And all my dogs are in it. My mom's dog is in it. And um, I like to do stuff with untrained dogs when I'm filming because you always get something wonderful to talk about that way. But um, I saw so much potential that I went ahead and extended it um, from, I wanted to just, my idea was to slap something together and just get it out there. But you know what, you guys, it's just not my style. I'm just not a slapper together at kind of gal. So Nick and Peggy and I and um, a couple other, oh, Christine is here too. Christine, I can't wait for you to see the commercial because it ends with this close up of Loretta on her mark smiling broadly. Um, so um, please keep on the lookout for that. And if you know any folks with young dogs or people that, have small areas or are trying to do agility without equipment. Um, I'm thinking this is gonna fill a lot of gaps. So um, uh, you'll be the first to know, oh, you learned of it recently. So we are calling it pre-agility. I got stuck on the name and my clean run commercial for it. Um, Kimbers can't wait, cool, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, it's fun stuff. So without further ado, I want to get into line setting. And I read the article and um, I've been writing, um, you know, I've only got two more issues to write for. I've been writing since 2009. So um, my, this article that I've been writing is boxes. Um, type to me, type me yes or no. And I'm expecting, um, I'm expecting 10 yeses or no's if you know what box handling is. So I'm gonna ask a couple more questions. So just, you've heard of it, you know what it is. Hey, Linda Wilford. Oh, and Suzanne is here. I've got some of my old cronies here, I love it. No, that's a compliment by the way. So just type yes, you've heard of box handling. Yes, yes, yes. Nobody has typed well, of course. No to Tanya, that's good to know. Um, nobody's typed duh. Um, Yes. Okay. So how many of you, and um, so I've got about half of you responding here. Some of you might be eating a juicy burger or something and your hands are full. So now I'm going to switch the question to, have you actually done box handling box drills before? 
So that's handling in a single box or a double box. Kathy's like, yes, <laughs> I did catch somebody eating. That's good. No, yes, no. Okay, so um, one more question. Oh, you took a seminar. Okay, Suzanne, tell me who taught that seminar? Who taught it? If you remember, you can say I don't remember if you don't. Ah, Laura Derrett. So I just wrote, should have added Laura, just wrote uh, Greg Derrett. Um, so I learned box handling from Greg and I learned more about box handling from Laura later on when I had the pleasure of teaching with her at a couple of camps and got to like really chew the fat about box handling. I think box handling is essential no matter what turn cues you use. Um, uh, how, is there anybody out there that hasn't heard of Greg Derrett? So if you have not heard of Greg Derrett, just type I haven't. And thanks for being interactive with me. Um, if for those of you not no, uh, not familiar with Zoom, there's a chat um, icon at the bottom of your black uh, Zoom screen. Okay, so um, Greg's program, and you guys can keep typing to me on that one, um, is called um, <laughs> Great Dog Shame About the Handler. <laughs> That's literally the name of it. So you can tell what kind of guy Greg is. And um, yeah, great dog shame about the handler. So that's all the box training you would ever need to know. The timing of the cues and some of that stuff I've modified a bit. But before we get into the article, I want to talk because I was telling you I'm writing an article, I just finished it today, about box handling. And I think when I looked at the article, I was like, oh, this article is definitely line setting. And it's definitely stuff about line setting that you need to know, but it's not the basics. Um, and boxes are the key place to learn about line setting. And boxes are the place that um, I think make it easy to understand, <laughs> not necessarily handle and do. So I'm gonna pull my screen close to this board and I will check the chat box, hopefully if I remember. Um, so if there's anybody, why don't, why don't a few of you just quickly type that you can see the board okay. I'm going here first with this jump. Can you see it? Yes, okay. Okay, good, 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 good. So you guys, when I say set a line, that means when I have, we're gonna use a jump and line setting can be done on other obstacles too. It's just not always so simple. But what I'm talking about is when my dog is heading to the jump from any direction, there is this zone that's I call the information zone. The information zone is not the same for your dog no matter what. So it, it isn't unfortunately a matter of figuring out the distance and saying my dog's information zone is 15 feet before each obstacle. Because the information zone is affected by the speed of the dog and the obstacle itself and the placement of the obstacle. So if the dog is coming off of the table, he's not gonna have as much momentum as if he's coming off a straight line and out of a straight tunnel. And whether or not there's a tunnel on the other side of the obstacle the dog is taking, or a corner of the course, when there's corners, the dogs wanna come back to the candy. I call the obstacles candy. They wanna get back to the candy. So the information zone on an obstacle that is on the corner or edge of a course, especially if you're asking that dog to turn away from the course to set a better line, which will get to line setting, is um, it's all line setting, guys. I didn't mean to sound like it, it wasn't. Um, uh, the information zone will be further or closer to that obstacle. So I always remind handlers of that. 
But what I want to do, no matter how my dog is approaching that jump, is to be able, imagine this next line that I'm going to draw as your dog's spine. I want to be able to put the dog across the jump like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, so that my dog will land in the lane of the next on-course obstacle. In my opinion, that's your job. So you have to take the time to do what's needed. Now, does that mean you have to be there? Not always. It depends on what you've trained. I can influence my dog on approach to an obstacle on the other side of the obstacle. I can influence him from behind. I can influence him from really anywhere. I have to know when that bubble breaks. <laughs> I have to know what I can do and what I can't do. Here's a tip. If you have to yell at your dog after he lands, you didn't do enough. In, or he didn't understand it, or it's not trained, or the judge did something super goofy with the course setup that made it once in a blue moon, uh, hard enough to maybe call impossible. So am I, will you ever hear me calling my dog after he's landed in competition? Yeah, sometimes I'm cementing the deal and sometimes I'm screwing up just like everybody else. I'm late or um, I'm late or I could be late. <laughs> uh, uh, or I didn't make my position. You guys, if you have a refusal someplace else, this is sometimes if I've got a plan where it's like dominoes, like sometimes you guys, if there's a move on obstacle 12, I have planned from obstacle four how I'm going to make that position for obstacle 12, literally. So if some domino, you know, where I know I'm not going to make that, if I don't have a plan B, I might just throw in the towel and do something else on the way out. I'm already out on that course. It never serves me well to um, handle badly. So if I'm completely out of position and there's no point, um, Sometimes I will make up my own course on exit. That doesn't happen too often. So what I'm talking about is the responsibility that you have to get the job done when your dog is in the information zone for them, for their belly, their spine. So there's the dog's head and there's the dog's tail to take that so that he's actually landing. So all you have to do is say, go. Go on hub, go on tunnel, uh, go scramble, go poles, um, because the work for the turn is already done. This is what I call line setting. This, this um, work that is done on approach to the jump. So there's no better way. This is part, if you were with me for directionals, I said I never turn my dog off of me with an obstacle name. If I'm crossing a box, for example, and the poles are over here, you see? And I'm on this side and my dog is going this way, I would never say poles. I would say right poles. If I was on this side, I would say here poles. So you guys, this is all important. Everything is connected to everything else. That's why I'm such a, everything I read and talk about is about consistency for tomorrow, consistency for tomorrow. So here we go. This course is five, six, seven, eight. So this looks like, People all the time in the course will say, well, the dog is going straight across the box. But if the dog is approaching the box from this direction, straight is eight. 
If the dog is approaching the box from this direction, straight is seven. And if the handler doesn't get the dog completely rotated, so if the dog is coming from over here, this is the straight line. This is really important to see on your course maps. So you either send the dog headed toward eight and do something drastic. See, and people don't think they have to do anything drastic because <laughs> the drastic thing has kind of happened before or after the jump. Because you, it, and I find it much easier to do it before the easier, <laughs> it, it, kinder, <laughs> kinder to my partner is really what I mean. Easier for my dog beyond, beyond the shadow of a doubt. But you guys, this can take a lot of work because this could, if this is a tight space, I've got to have all the patience. I got to do what I got to do to get that dog jumping like this because this is the straight line. What a lot of people will do is just be glad they got the dog over this jump and then they scream. And then what happens is the dog comes back and now they've got the dog taking this jump this way and they call the dog to come back this way. Guess what happens? Somebody type it for me. I'll take a drink while you type. What, what will happen to six? You'll miss it. Uh, you could for sure. You could miss it going either way. What would happen if you don't miss it? Anybody ever have a bar come down? Uh, you, could, you could for sure get a back jump, for sure, because the dog lands here, you call, and he comes right back over. So, so you know, the, the bars coming down, um, the back jumping, the, you know, whenever you get this domino effect, and judge, you guys, you can have a line go south with that domino effect, on a subtle line. It doesn't have to be this drastic. So the information zone for five is here where the handler has to do something, decel, pull cue, whatever it is, before the dog is taking the jump. If you're practicing box handling and you have to scream come to get the dog to do to head for six, um, then some enough work wasn't done. And this is just wonderful practice. And then the same thing here. So say you do all the work here. What a lot of times what happens to me is I'm congratulating myself as my dog goes sailing over six. And I forget I've got the same dilemma coming up right here at seven. And people will say, well, he's going straight across. If he takes seven, in a natural way, without you influencing, he will take seven like this. This, now this five backwards is the straight line from six. This is an amazingly difficult tight turn. So, so the cueing of seven happens before six where you're queuing a 270. But you gotta remember when you queue a 270, you could need the dog to go there. You could possibly need this jump eight could be here. And then you need the dog to go here. So now my drawing's getting pretty messy. So I'm gonna spare you. The basic thing that you have to know is how your dog is gonna land. If he takes the bar like that, that's his on-course obstacle if you say go. If you say go, in order to get this jump, he would have to take the bar like this. So if he's coming from here, something has to happen here. Okay, all right. So you got a lot of responsibility. Let's look at the article because I have a couple more. Um, drawings in mind for you. Thanks for the help with that, you guys. All right, share screen, share screen, go over by chat. 
Oh, we don't need this. So the, the whole term setting the line, um, I worry that newbies think that it's not, I, I think it's like, oh, I'll just teach all this stuff and I'll worry about that later. But you guys, it is the power steering. It is what happens between the obstacles and you're gonna find out sooner or later that the steering between the obstacles takes a lot more study, work, effort, than the training of the obstacles themselves. And um, the, new, the new class I'm coming up with is gonna help with that a lot. So the setting of the line as soon as it can be done means um, determining where the information zone not necessarily just is, but as early as it can be. Sometimes the information zone for the next obstacle, especially on a wrap, is the refusal line of the obstacle before. So let's um, look at this first. So if you've got a printed course map, you guys, studying course maps is really, really useful. When I was going to um, Worlds, I probably printed out, I don't know, 70 course maps from the judges I was gonna compete under. And I imagined, you know, the best path for the dog and how to handle them. And I forced it down my own throat. I didn't want to do it. I didn't believe how much I could get from it. But I, I think that um, if you could get a hold of some course maps, and lots of judges have pages where they put, they post their courses, and spend a little time seeing if you can determine um, the best line. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we said, we're going to quit saying the best line, but the the most fun line for the dog. Um, so that whole theory of best line is could trap you. Um, and there's an argument there for what's the best line, because is it the easiest line for the dog or is it the easiest line for the handler? So in my mind's eye, what I'm looking for when I say the best line for, is for the dog. And the judges these days are getting really clever at making the best line for the dog the difficult line to handle. But I see handlers all the time freak out because they think they've never seen something just because the angle is a little bit different. If it's technically a 180 and you've done one, it's just a little different. So um, my students all the time will say, I've never seen that before. And it's like, you didn't get to open if you've not, you have, <laughs> you just don't remember it. So in the configuration articles that I'm writing for Clean Run now, there's a lot, that's why I did them, so that people could start recognizing, hey, that's just a pinwheel. Because it's a tunnel, an A-frame, and a jump, I'm not recognizing it as a pinwheel, or that's just a box. And, um, uh, the new article on boxes is good. It, it shows how to find those things. So this article went a little bit more into finding the best line as well as how to set the best line. And let's just go to this first diagram here. So, and I'm gonna take it a step further on the next one. So often, like I said, so this is a little shorter to go this way, but also the angle of the jump. So this four is shooting, the dog is taking the, remember the drawing with the dog's spine? So that dog's head and tail would be going like that. This dog's head and tail would be going like that. And that means the turn to six is also a softer turn. If the dog lands here, it's a harder turn to six. Also bars. The softer the turn, the more likely the bar to stay up. So in this case, I would find a way to take my dog. So let's pretend three is here. I would find a way. Well, if three was there, I might. Let's say that three is here. <laughs> here. So this is, um, well, we would have to say, let me help you, let me help. We could have three here. So this would be, this could be um, three, four, 
five, six. Would four to five ever work this way? Yes, if three was here. That's why I couldn't use that as an example. If three was here, that might be better. This is the fun thing about line setting. The thing you gotta know is that you can't tell from four to five, even if the dog is coming from here or here with three. You cannot tell from four, if, from four to five, you have to take six into consideration. You must take six into consideration when knowing which way to go on five. Which way the dog is coming from three influences, but not completely. So I'm sorry that that sounds a little bit um, difficult, but the, uh, I'm gonna say it again a little bit cleaner than I just did. The approach jump is less taken into consideration than the jump you're gonna end up on. So if I, so this line to get, to go this way from four to five is easy and to go this way from four to five is easy. What we're talking about is six. So in my classes, if I said, if I said to you right now, how do I know which way to go on number seven on any course? Look at nine. How do I know which way to go on number four, any course? Look at six. Almost always, 99% of the time, your answer is there. The preceding obstacle influences only sometimes, but I'm going to show you where it does on a better diagram, which is here. So if we had another obstacle here, you guys, we would have options of going five this way or five this way. And we would have also options of going four this way and four this way. So when you have a back to back, two obstacles in a row that have an option, what I do is I draw it on my course map and I literally look at lead lead on the paper and how sharp the angle is and how how much lead is on the paper how long the distance is the trouble is is whether or not you're handling a dane a border collie or a chihuahua because the physical capabilities are going to determine what to do on those jumps so in this case i already told you that if the dog takes for this direction he's going to take this, he's going to be set up for this off course jump. So four also takes this jump out of play as well as making the turn to six easier. So for you newbies, skip a jump. If you want to know which way to go on four, skip a jump. And if you are going, if you have another jump here and you're going to six and you've got to decide which way to go on this jump and which way to go on this jump, as well as which way to go on this jump and which way to go on this jump, you actually may have to take the next one. So yeah, it gets a little complicated. Um, and what I'll do is I'll say, is it a donut? Is it a U-turn or is it a hairpin? And if I've got two or three hairpins, or two or three donuts, I'm gonna start looking for those U-turns. And it's just like counting them. Am I creating too many difficult turns, harsh turns? And then I'll find the softest way for the path to go. I call it the bricklayer's path. If you were laying bricks around a gold fish pond and around rose garden, you would go soft and smooth. You wouldn't go herky-jerky. You wouldn't create a zigzag. You would do round soft. So that's another way to look at how to create a soft pattern. The bigger the dog, the faster the dog, the more essential the softer pattern has to be. Um, the littler the dog, here's another thing you might have to take into consideration. You guys, some dogs have strengths and weaknesses on their sides. They can turn one way better than the other. So if you have a dog that doesn't, that knocks bars or has a stiffness on the right side and doesn't on the left, you may also take that into consideration. So 
I'm sorry that this, this isn't like, okay, here's the formula that will always work. But when you work with me, you're, I'm always going to be talking about breeds and exceptions. What I hope to do today is tell you, is get you to understand that there's a lot to consider and the ways that I go about making the decisions. There's not a, a hard recipe, although you will almost always be right if you just skip the next obstacle, remembering that four to five is almost always going to be easy going both ways. Look at five to six five to six going that way is easy five to six going that way is easy but how much of a turn based on where seven is if seven is over here i'm not going to want to go this way and then this way i'm going to take the dog this way on five to go to six to get over here if i go this way on five I may decide to go this way on four instead of this way. So you guys, what I want you to do is determine the softer turns to set up your dog for the next thing before you decide if you can handle it. If you try to figure out the handling, you're going to waste too much time. Figure out the best path for sure, for your dog, it, you're gonna get really good at it. You have to get really good at it. Otherwise, it's not just about being a clever handler. It's about having those knocked bars and those off courses because you're setting your dog up to go in the wrong direction. It just, it would be like, I'm gonna, you know, I'm not so good at steering my car or working the accelerator and the gas, but I'm just gonna go. Well, you'll, you're gonna end up crashing. There's no two ways about it. So after you've determined the best line for the dog, then really figure out if you, you can come up with any way to handle it. Remember, the way to handle it may be a little bit hard, but, but be honest about if you can do it. If, if it's a series of front crosses, just say, this is just a series of front crosses. This is just two side changes. I have three or four ways to get a side change in. And then you're going to start relaxing about these decisions. And you'll be able to say, it's just a pull to a rear, to a front. Yeah, I have to do it right. Yeah, I have to be focused. Yeah, if I don't do it right, it won't work. But talk it through instead of, oh, I'm afraid. <laughs> One of my articles is called, I'm afraid that. I'm afraid that if, and well, yeah, you, you got to do it. You got to do it right. Okay. Oh, look, there's an ad for... <laughs> The two on two off contact program <gasps> by who there's no name on there <gasps> sandy rogers sorry guys i didn't plan that okay so now again we're going to get into some line setting and uh this is this to me this number three is one that most if i was showing somebody this on course they would say hold the phone sandy i am facing the off course end of the tunnel. I do not want to be doing that. You guys, paralleling the path is you're often, if you're paralleling the path correctly, you are often heading yourself to an off course obstacle. But look at this guy. If you're heading to the on course obstacle, you are actually paralleling the path to that I'm sorry, if you're facing the on-course tunnel end, you are paralleling the path to the off-course tunnel. And this is the exact dilemma that I see handlers stomp off the course because they're going, I was pointing right at it. Well, there are more times than not, lots more times than not, that we are paralleling our dog's path. And if we cut into our dog, we expect them to give way. And if we peel off, we expect them to come with. At least I do. It's an advantage. If I, if I space invade my dog's line, I expect them to give way to me, just like I do the Volkswagen when I'm in my minivan. <laughs> I expect them to get out of my way if I'm changing lanes. That's why we have turn signals. You guys, you got to be a turn signal. You are the turn signal. Your feet are the turn signal. So um, now if I'm behind, that's a little bit of a different story. So what am I going to say to my dog 
as I release him. Am I going to use his release word? You guys, when my border collie is in the two-on-two -two off on a contact, I happen to have a two-on-two -two off on the A-frame. So that's why this dog is here, because this dog is a running contact and the handler has to set that line sooner. Tuxedo, when he's at the bottom, guess what he's doing? He's going like this, which one is it, mama? Which one is it, which one is it, which one is it? So if I say, okay, I'm gonna get wherever his little beady eyes were scanning. So I'm gonna release on the word here tunnel, as if it's one wrong, very distinct here tunnel. And because my cue is gonna be so blatantly clean, I am not gonna to have to hold it. He will know the instance he hears here tunnel and sees my foot paralleling that path that he can eat that tunnel for lunch. I am not gonna to have to keep moving. Now, if I pull, if I do, if I pull off when he's right there, I could interrupt him and then and then the handlers stomp off the course and they say he knew it. he knew it i told him he knew it well then you gave a second cue is the dog supposed to follow the second cue i always go back to the drop on recall if i've said come and then i give you a drop cue i expect you to drop and abandon ship on the recall so um, I hope that that helps. With contacts, I am trying to have the line set before the contact is completed. If you have running contacts, this is something you work out with your dog because I don't want to give cues too early. I wanna give them just at the right time, just like my car. It's like, well, can I turn the car too early or too late? No, you need to turn it when your car, whether you're driving a, um, Maserati or a Mack truck will determine when you turn, how you turn and how much you brake. So um, this is critical stuff. All right, this little guy, I wanna move a little bit and I can't, so I'm just gonna tell you. So this, this might be confusing to you guys. Um, this handler is running into SERP position. And the reason that this is SERP position, if you came to SERPs, and if you didn't, you can go there right after we're done to the YouTube channel and look up SERPs. But my definition of SERP handling is I am at least 50%, which this guy is, I hope you can see my cursor, I'm at least 50% across the obstacle. If I have not made it at least 50% across the obstacle, my dog should not think he's turning left. So this handler is going to cert position and this handler is going to front cross position. So this guy's just running straight, there's no turn. The dog starts on his left and ends up on his left. This handler has his dog on his right and he's gonna run up here and front cross and then have the dog on the left. So again, the, do, the handler has put this end of the tunnel out of play. If this handler could not be here before the dog got there, he would not be using that cue. It's essential, it's critical, it's a must have. The, do, the handler must be in this position before the dog gets to the, to the end of the contact. Otherwise he's gonna do what this guy did and pull, you understand? So the other handler was able to plan to be up here. This handler couldn't make it, so he's gonna use a pull cue. This handler is gonna use a serp cue because he can be that far ahead. This handler will be here before either dog is where they're showing. And this handler will be there before either dog is where it's showing. Now this handle, the same thing here. This handler is running up to do a front cross. This handler is running across to do a serp. You guys, if I could have my way, I would move this, this guy, actually this lane to this end of the tunnel is open. And I would actually wanna move this handler to right exactly where my cursor is. So sometimes when we're doing these diagrams as we've talked about before, um, these little, little things get changed. Um, 
in between. Uh, yeah, I do proof them all, but I would have moved this guy a little bit here. So he should technically be here because the, this handle has not come across quite enough to make this lane obvious. That's a positional cue. And whether or not the handler is standing still and sending the dog or running all the way to the tunnel or running halfway to the tunnel is all about that dog and that handler. Um, but I would not release the dog to go to this end of the tunnel with that path open, even though the dog would have to cut in front of me. And this, you guys, I don't prefer cues that require my dog to run across my feet. I'm better off if my dogs think they shouldn't cut behind me or in front of me. But I have a few cues that do that. I just only use them if I have no other choice. So I am not hungry to use cues where the dogs cut across the front of me. So whether you're new or seasoned, um, notice if you're ever specifically telling your dogs to cut across your feet. There are some cues that are popular now that are that. And they'll actually say, I thought I would just send the dog across the front of me. Um, I have no reason to practice that. If I have to do it, it's a last choice handling. Um, and I see handlers that use it frequently get into a little bit of a trouble. Whatever your dog is allowed to do, you guys, it's like jumping up. My, my, my mentor, Pat Cook, when handlers would, you know, students, when we taught pet, pet training, they would say, you know, I want my dog to jump up, but I don't want him to ever jump up on the wrong person. And I only want him to jump up on me when I'm not wearing nylons. Now they didn't say that. Most people don't wear nylons anymore, but that's what they meant. If I'm in sweats, it's okay. If I'm dressed up, it's not. Um, and my, Pat used to say, a dog that is sometimes allowed to jump up will sometimes make a mistake. So if you're living in a, you know, a retirement community, you're probably best to teach that dog to never put his paws up on anyone ever, including you. If you want to have a specific cue, you can train it, but the dog will. So that's kind of how I look across, going across my feet. I've digressed. Um, any questions about either of these? Was there one up here? Any of the diagrams we've seen so far? You guys can just unmute yourselves and ask me. We've got 20 minutes only. Any questions on this diagram? That was just showing that one way is further. This diagram was showing that there's more of a turn and less of a turn on five towards six by the way you go on four. Just waiting for somebody to interrupt me. This shows how pointing at the quote unquote correct end is also cueing, is cueing the wrong obstacle. This is an off course obstacle. This is cueing, you know, same way to cue the same thing in a different way, different ways to cue the same thing. No questions? Okay, this is one of my favorites. And this is what lane to travel in. So there's lines and lanes. They're setting the Andy, line. I don't know if yep. you can hear me. I can. Yep. Oh, I had a I had a question on, I guess it would be figure four. Okay. So that was where there was a front cross zone versus the SERP handling. Mm hmm It's actually so if Yeah, so I guess my question is, if I didn't think that I was going to make it to the front cross, that I couldn't be fast enough to do that, would it be better, like I, I would never, well, I guess it all depends on where the previous obstacle was, but assuming that it was obstacle one, like it's marked right there, I would actually not think to go to the far side of the A-frame to run around to, to like, uh, to do the SERP handling into the tunnel. You wouldn't if that was a lead out and that was true one and two. And there's a thing about the numbers that it's hard. For, like I would have numbered that five and six. And um, I have, okay. yeah. So, so it's an excellent, excellent question. If this was a lead out, I would be leading out to here and calling the dog off the A-frame. I would be doing a lead out for sure. And this is, 
my point is if the handler had to come from here or if the handler had to be on this side. Okay. Does that answer? Thank it? you. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I like to take the shortest route always. Yeah. That being that's okay. amazing having that labeled one and two. Very good point. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Thank you. Don't worry about it being because that's a really, really, really good point. Okay, you guys are officially, it's quarter till, so you're officially welcome to butt in. So this is, um, this probably should have been called initial lane setting. So you guys setting the line is what we talked about on the board and what I'm showing here, but there's also what lane you travel in. So it's just like the freeway. You can be next to the car next to you, or you can be three lanes over and still paralleling. So this happens all the time. Handlers, especially novice handlers, you guys, the, the, the course will be, and again, pretend you guys, this is five, six, seven. And the handler is well set up for six, but they have to run around this wing and by virtue of running around the wing, they've now cued this jump. And I call this having passage. This handler, see how close this handler is running to the A-frame and how far this handler is away from the A-frame? Because the dog came out of the tunnel and the handler was like, oh crap, I got to start this handler. Oh crap, I got to start handling number two. And then they're not allowed to jump the jump, darn it. So they go to run around and that lane change that they make pulls the dog off of three. And then you'll see them push on the dog. You guys, this is why dogs end up running slow. They get so sick of it. They get so sick of being told we're going this way. Whoops, sorry, no, we're not. So um, this, is, this, is, this handler has chosen the lane that is closer to the A-frame. This handler chose the lane they were forced into because they didn't plan to be over here. So I would have put my dog into the tunnel from this lane. I wouldn't have run in because then I got to remember to run back out. And if my dog comes out of that tunnel fast, because it's a 15 foot tunnel instead of a 20 foot tunnel. So that's something you can always look at. How long is that tunnel? How long is my dog going to be in there? How much time do I have to lane change? But it's important that I'm in the correct lane with the correct line before that dog gets out of that tunnel. Tunnels are the easiest place to start practicing line setting because you get a little breather. But so many handlers will just be facing the hole that the dog is coming out to get the dog's attention. Yo, I'm over here. And they don't mind that on-site foot and get that lane that line set and they are not worried about the lane they're in until the, until the whole party starts moving. So if you can plan to be in this lane, send the dog to the tunnel from this lane, then you have very little work to do because you have passage around this wing. This handler did not have passage on the wing. So now you see what to do and can you be closer to influence a turn? Sure, in a lane. So if Tuck saw me running over here, he would be thinking that I'm setting him up to go straight. Does that mean I would never cue this turn from over here? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It just means that I am consistent enough with choosing the lane I want to be in for him to start putting two to two together, what it means for that course. Okay. Hey Sandy, I've got another question. And yeah, it's probably too basic, maybe, for what you were planning on covering. But like, what does the anatomy of setting that line on 5A look like? Because I assume that I still, even if I'm in that location where the green box was, mm -hmm. I know that my feet are facing that direction, but my chest is still pointing toward the exit of the tunnel. So yeah, so the little uh, the little guy right there. I assume that you know my feet are facing there, and if I'm at that in that lane, but I assume that my upper body is still rotated back, or yeah. maybe it's 
let's go there. I, I, I'm not sure how that looks. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna complicate this for you because complicating things is my favorite thing to do in life. So it's a really good question, and I think that this, this is gonna answer it in two ways. So I like to think of my, I, I joke that that's why we have a waist and a neck. So if you can think about your lower body cueing the dog for what's next and your upper body mm -hmm, the future connected so my lower body setting the okay. line in the line for the next thing and my upper body is staying with my dog here's you guys for everything this is why after 30 years i still adore teaching agility because for everything there is a counter <laughs> Nothing's absolute. I mean, I think golf is like that and maybe other sports, but there's, there's, when your attempt, when your life's mission is to be consistent, that's my life's mission, is to be consistent. You have to be open to how often we have so we're, we have these whole bodies, our heads, our arms, our legs, our feet, and these do and all these obstacles and all these paths and all these lines and all these lanes and you know there's like twenty some obstacles, and the courses you know the upper levers aren't easy. So here's the here's a dilemma. Yourself bigger, huh? Can you make yourself bigger? Can I make the board bigger? Yeah. Does that no, work? or just uh, take? Take the other view. Oh, 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 I can, I can, I can, I can. Thank you. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. She's very cheap. Thank you. Is it bigger? Yes. Okay. So I stopped sharing, but it didn't make me do it twice. So here's here's this upper body, lower body dilemma. And this falls under what this article isn't about, but I've been writing about it all day, so it's on my mind. It, it's it, it, it's a long version of your question though. You guys, the key to one of the keys, the ideal thing when you're crossing a box, cueing, setting a line to go straight, I told you, you gotta have the dog take the bar in the way, if you want him to take that jump, he's gotta take it that way. If you want him to take this jump, he's gotta take it that way. If you want him to go straight, he's gotta take the bar straight. So the work has to be done on approach. So he set up for it. And then we are talking about, you know, what lane, if you start, you never want to be in the middle of the box. If you start floating in, that line is going to send him over here. If you start pulling away too much, if he's ahead of you, it's going to pull him there. So which lane here you're going to travel in, how close to this jump versus how close to these, depends on where you're going after this jump. So what happens is people, have done the work here perfectly. The dog takes the bar just like that. They know it's a huge advantage to get ahead. Why? Because the dog is now chasing them. That's a fundamental key thing that you can do to cross a box. So the handler is here when the dog is approaching the jump. That's ideal. But then they, because they're brilliant and they learned to stay connected, which is what you're essentially talking to. Can I set the line and be in the correct lane and still rotate my upper body to stay connected, watch my dog come out of the tunnel? So if your basic question was, should I see my dog come out of the tunnel? The answer is yes. And if your question is, would my upper body and my lower body have to say two different things? The answer is yes. But what you have to do if you're passing obstacles is realize that if you get way ahead and you can't see your dog in your peripheral vision, and all of my programs talk about enhancing peripheral vision, and my new program after pre is going to be three hats, and one of them is going to be real key basic ways to be a better handler, and increasing peripheral vision skills is a simple way that you can do at your office or in your car um, is when the handler is up here and they look back to see if their dog is coming, the dog will read that look back as the beginning of a front cross. 
So all of my programs talk about when does your cue actually start and end? So the dog is well on this line. The handler is in the perfect position to cue this jump going straight, but he's also in the perfect position to cue this jump. And I've had this talk with other handlers and they'll say, well, then the goal is to be further ahead. Well, if I rotate when my dog is, if my dog is here and I'm up here and I rotate, that's still a turn cue. That should still put my dog over this jump. This is the on course jump. So the handler, I'm gonna put this on me now. So the handler is running saying, this is what I do when we go straight. This is what I do when I front cross. So the handler is running straight, but they look back. And that is the beginning of the front cross cue for the dog. It doesn't matter what the handler intended. And I see top handlers that know how to do this, that know how to set this line and know how to get ahead, come off course as mad as hornets because they didn't realize that they cued a front cross when they checked back with their dog. So what I do is if I'm crossing something that requires my dog to pass obstacles and go perfectly straight, is I glue my shoulders to my hips with rebarb. And if I have to look back, I, I either don't look back, which is scary and not my favorite thing, or I don't get so far ahead. I run at a distance that I can be ahead and still make contact by just turning my head and using my peripheral vision, which I practice a lot. Because you guys, it's not about actually seeing the dog. Like right now, I can, like if you said, can you see the board? I would want to say no, but I can tell it's there. <laughs> so that's the difference. If you took that board away, I would notice it. If I was here and you took that board away, I wouldn't know. So that's what I'm talking about, just getting comfortable with what you can see. And then you can stay forward. And the other thing, if I'm patting my leg, I won't pat the side of my leg as, I look, as, I, as I'm trying to make contact. I pat the front of my leg, and then that keeps this shoulder if I'm saying come. You guys, these are little teeny tiny tricks that are so easy, you know, and they really will help the dog. But this is my front cross. So for my dog, if you ask my dog at what point, when does it turn into a front cross? When does this mean go straight? Is it a front cross now, 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 now? You can't say the dog has to wait. You can't say my shoulder shouldn't matter. They do. You, you, that's not an acceptable, I'm gonna teach my dog to never respond to my shoulders. Can't, can't have it, not on the table. So that was the long, when you understand the power of my bottom half of my body going one way and the top half of my body staying connected to my dog, to get full value of it, you also have to know when it's gonna bite you in the butt. And just about everything, like <laughs> I could go on and on about that. <laughs> when things look the same and they're not, when a, when a turn could look like, when the physical cueing looks like it means left and looks like it means right when you're approaching a jump at an angle. Okay, all right, questions. Thank you. Uh, did that answer, did that help? When all you wanted to know is <laughs> if you should watch the dog come out of the tunnel. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? So type me. Let's go back to chat. Type me if that, this was valuable, invaluable. I'm a bad driver. Uh, let me think. Where's the next obstacle? Yes, where's the next obstacle? That would be part of your decision. I think I probably covered that after you typed that. The far side of the A-frame. No, um, if I don't think I can make the front cross, would it be better to take the far side of the A-frame and do the SERP handling? Which side of the A-frame you are on is going to be dictated by the obstacles before? And I might have explained that again. Sorry, I promised you guys I would keep an eye on chat and I did not. Very valuable. Lots to think about valuable. Oh, let's talk about get, I said in the, I said in the, um, 
article, I can torture you another couple minutes. This, I used to get made fun of that, but I would go over a jump. I did this for years. I got down in tunnels and did this. I can remember being at nationals once and some guy making fun of me because I wanted to see what the dog saw. You guys, if you get down to your dog's level, I ran little dogs too. I probably look really stupid. You can actually like at the start line, use like a wing of a jump to take another, to block another obstacle. Like if you set your dog over a little bit, you'll be able to see. And then if you take a jump, you're like, holy shit, he's looking at the complete wrong thing. And then, I, and then the other thing I do is I'll do this. I'll go, okay, how much do I have to turn? Oh, there's my on-course obstacle. And it's like, wow, I got to get that dog turned a lot over that bar before that on-course obstacle is in play. So um, I don't have to do that anymore, but I did it for years and years and years. And I will think you're smart if I see you doing that at the show. <laughs> All right. So you guys are saying it's valuable. That makes me feel great. Tell your friends, please. And uh, go look at what else is up and the, on the YouTube channel. We'll get those on the website soon. I'm almost done. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming. Good to see you. Thanks for having your cameras on. Hey, Christine. Thanks, Sandy. Thanks. See you, see you soon. Yeah. I can't, wait, I can't wait for you to see the commercial with Loretta's little where is, human. Where is, the, where is that going to be? It's, I hope it's going to be everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that will be impossible to miss. It's like on Cleans Run. Uh, It'll be, I made two versions, one for the experienced handler and then one for the newbie. So one will be on my website and one will be on Clean Run. But um, Nick did a real good job with it. And Loretta's got, uh, like I said, at the very, it's so cute because you and I are smiling at her and she's on the mark looking at you. And then all of a sudden she just does like this at the camera and we zoom in on her. It's really cute. So, so it ends with her little smiling corgi smile and tail and the whole enchilada. <laughs> I'm pleased with it. So thank you very much for helping with that. Oh, you bet. You bet. My pleasure. All right, guys. I'll see you next week. Good to okay. see you, Linda. Please give Randall my best.